I went to Korea in May of 2012, invited by the East Seoul Presbytery of the PROK, the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea. I was asked to come and work with a group of pastors to help them improve and enhance their English language speaking skills. I traveled to Korea on behalf of Global Ministries, a common witness of the United Church of Christ and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. They had appointed me to serve as a short-term volunteer missionary. The PROK prides itself in being the liberal progressive voice of faith in South Korea. The denomination separated from the much larger Presbyterian Church of Korea, the PCK, in 1953 over issues of biblical inerrancy. The PCK was heavily influenced by the fundamentalist theology of the original missionaries, and to a large extent still is. However, with the birth of the PROK, a new horizon was opened in theological scholarship and mission. Rev. Lee Kang Sil is the co-pastor of Gobek Presbyterian Church in Jeonju. That's a city of some 700,000, about three hours south of Seoul. She wrote her doctoral dissertation on the problems of dealing with the tension between social justice and personal salvation in the Korean Protestant Church. It's a tension, frankly, I experienced while I was working with my small group of pastors. From her doctoral dissertation, she says that the Protestant missionaries first launched their mission work in Korea in 1885. That means the Korean Protestant Church is now 127 years old. Yet the Korean Church has grown rapidly to the extent that one-fourth of the population of Korea is Christian. Moreover, Korea has the largest church in the world, with almost 150,000 members in one single church. The spirituality of Korean Christians is very strong. Besides Sunday worship, most churches have a midweek service on Wednesday evening. On Friday, they have worship in houses arranged according to living districts. But the spirituality of Korean churches is most evident at the daybreak prayer meetings held every day, in some cases as early as 4 a.m. My host on a rural farm near Jeonju, Rev. Jung Byung Gil, conducts daybreak prayer services at his home every day at 6 a.m. I was expected to be present for those services. The Pacific Northwest Conference of the United Church of Christ has had a partnership with the PROK since 1993. Delegations have been exchanged between the two countries every year since then. Last year, we hosted a delegation of six young adult Korean women in 2011. Next year, in 2013, we're planning to send a young adult delegation to Korea. We'll also be hosting a delegation in 2013 from Korea as we observe and celebrate the 20th anniversary of our partnership. I'd like you to meet the pastors in our classes in Seoul. Most serve very small churches, some with as few as 40 or 50 members. Seo Dong Young's church is an exception. That's Dong Kwan Church with more than a thousand members. I'm told that's considered a medium sized church by Korean standards. Dong Kwan is one of the churches where I was invited to preach. The others were Se Hem Church and Dai Chi Church, where I presented special commemorative gifts to the pastors of each church. Because worship space is at a premium, many churches rent space in commercial buildings, like this one where Say Hymn Church has a space on the sixth floor, and just down the hallway there's a large Pentecostal church worshiping there. A full gospel church meets on the fifth floor. A grocery store, several restaurants, a department store, and a variety of business offices occupy the building. Our group met for two hours a day, four days a week during the entire month of May, on the sixth floor of this building. I would begin each class session with the question, so how's the weather in your life? When we were saying our goodbyes, they asked me the same question. How's the weather in your life? Perfect! <laughs> A simple question, but one that would frequently lead to challenging topics personal health, the difficulties of ministry in small churches, theological differences of opinion, and politics. Most notably, the politics of reunification of North and South Korea, a complicated, complex, and deeply divisive issue throughout South Korea today. 
Our time together was rich, and the generosity of my hosts was overwhelming. I was invited to family gatherings, clergy spouse retreats, shared meals together, visits to Buddhist temples, and significant historical sites, including an observatory overlooking North Korea. It's, it's been so good to be in your midst and to have met all of you and to have become friends with all of you. I think that's the most important part about these kinds of events, these kinds of gatherings, are these opportunities to become friends. When I think about the term partnership, uh, that's a good term. But for me, what's even more important is the term friendship. As we pose for our final photos together and to say goodbye, one of the pastors whispered to me, your disciples. For the most part, the pastors told me they tended not to comment on social justice issues from their pulpits, preferring instead to emphasize the gospel of personal salvation, which I found a bit curious, given that their church does pride itself on being the liberal progressive voice of faith in Korea. Some even spoke of their desire to become more conservative in order to attract larger numbers of worshipers, just like those big conservative evangelical congregations were doing. At the end of our time together, however, the conversation began to shift. Isn't Barack Obama a member of the United Church of Christ, they asked. Well, yes, I said, he used to be. I explained a little bit about the flap that developed over Jeremiah Wright, causing Obama to distance himself. Didn't he just endorse gay marriage, they wanted to know. Yes, I said, he did. Well, what do you think about that? I fully support his position, I told them. It's not an overstatement to say they were stunned totally stunned. Here I was, a person with whom they had developed some degree of respect, supporting same-sex marriage. But the Bible condemns homosexuality. The Bible said, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, one in the group said. I felt like I had walked into a religious right talking point machine. Which brings me to our visit here, at Gumsan Church. This is one of those churches established by those early missionaries in the late 1800s, preaching fundamentalist theology. The sanctuary is L-shaped, built this way in order to separate the men from the women. All the women were required to sit in one area, facing the side of the pulpit. The men sat on the right side in this picture, facing the front of the pulpit. The historical marker out front says that arrangement was created in order to be faithful to the biblical mandate that the women should remain silent in the church and presumably separated. The sign also said the practice was discontinued, and I think it said in the mid-1970s. Why did they discontinue the practice? I asked my friends. Because their understanding of Scripture had changed, I was told. Well, that's when I missed my opportunity to suggest that perhaps many understandings of Scripture had changed over the years, maybe even the condemnation of homosexuality. But that thought didn't come to me until a few days later. In any event, I think some seeds of change might have been sowed. I hope so. Which brings me back now to Gobak Church in Jeonju. It's called a Confessing Church, in the tradition of the Confessing Church movement of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany. It's a church that dares to speak out against government oppression, which Pastor Lee Kang-sil tells me is very much a reality in South Korea. Gobek is a church rooted in the tradition of social justice. My host during the last week of my visit, Rev. Jung Byung-gil, introduced me to Gobek Church and Rev. Kang-sil. Byung-gil serves pastors and farmers in the rural areas of South Korea. <laughs> Reverend Jung Byung-gil is the director of the Christian Agricultural Development Institute in the rural area of the West Central region of South Korea, about a three-hour drive south of Seoul. He raises chickens and sells their eggs to finance a ministry of working with pastors who serve rural churches. His 5,500 chickens produce as many as 6,000 eggs a day. The eggs are sold at an egg producer's farm cooperative in Seoul. He'll soon expand the venture to 14,000 chickens. Reverend Jong served as the pastor of a rural church in the same area for many years, then at a church in the big city of Seoul before returning to his first love, working with churches and pastors in the country. 
Reverend John donates some of his eggs to this church, Gobeck Presbyterian in nearby John Jew, to help them raise money for their ministry. Reverend Lee Kang Sil is the co-pastor, along with her husband, Han Sang Yo. However, Han Sang Yo was imprisoned a year and a half ago for visiting North Korea to try and create avenues of communication to discuss reunification of the two Koreas. Not only was the visit in violation of South Korean government policy, he was pummeled by the hardline Christian right, accusing him of praying with the North Koreans for the well-being of their supreme leader, Kim Jong-il, something he says he did not do. But the radical Christian right claimed he did. That probably infuriated the government more than his unsanctioned visit. He was sentenced to three years in prison. He could be released next March or August, depending on the outcome of December's elections. Gobek Church is described as a confessional church, one that has taken a strong public stance against oppressive government policies, even describing the current government as a dictatorship. It's clearly a minority and controversial religious voice in South Korea. Members of Gobek are discriminated against in society and in the workplace. Many employers even refuse to hire them. My visit wasn't all work and teaching. My hosts were very gracious and made sure I got an exposure to life in Korea not found on the beaten path of tourism. The young adult women with whom I met elevated me to royalty. I'm now known in some circles as King Edward, but not very many circles. Not only were seeds of friendship planted and nourished with our partners in the PROK, but I was invited to attend a unique international mission gathering, the Northeast Asia Mission Conference. It was an unexpected bonus where I was to meet even more new friends. Greeting the church from Taiwan. Uh, greeting from the church of in Taiwan. Hello. Greetings from Church of Japan. Uh, greetings from Church of uh, Korea. The Northeast Asia Mission Association gathered in Korea for its 39th annual meeting. They've been meeting every year since 1973. Delegates from churches in Taiwan, Japan, and Korea gather annually to share stories and ideas about how the church is able to make a difference in each of their countries. The theme of this year's gathering was focused on how the churches could provide services and assistance to undocumented foreign workers in their countries. Logistics are a challenge. Delegates listen on headsets as reports from each country are translated into their own languages. This year's gathering was hosted at Oak Valley, a golf and ski resort near the east coast of the Korean Peninsula. Taiwan will host the 2013 gathering the association will meet in Japan the following year. The three-day conference was a rich mixture of business, prayer, and music, concluding with a rousing service of worship at Dongpo Church in the Seoul South Presbytery. As we departed, several of my newfound friends said see you in Taiwan next year. My time in Korea was the best of times, I won't say worst of times, but certainly there were challenging times. I found the hospitality beyond anything that could be imagined. I found the food pretty good, occasionally challenging. I was constantly told that virtually everything I ate was good for my health. 
But most importantly, I found and made new friends. I found our time together to be a living example of understanding how we are all people of God, related to one another more intricately than we might have ever known, living in a world together, singing together, praying together, being the church together, learning and experiencing new cultures and new traditions, and knowing that we are each a gift in God's creation. There's a line in the hymn in the midst of new dimensions that says this, As we stand a world divided by our own self-seeking schemes, grant that we, your global village, might envision wider dreams. And that's our prayer, as we continue to reach out to be partners and friends all around God's world.